Something or Other Publishing, Wade Franson, is the host of Created in the Image of God, a series that examines the role of religion in society. From messianic returns to the emotive responses transmitted throughout our culture, Wade fearlessly addresses reality claims from all directions, objectively exploring their compatibility with Holy Scripture. Joining him are groundbreaking artist and podcaster Jacqueline Clare, whose focus on spiritual realism is summarized by the quote, when we don't take the high road with our choices and miss the opportunity to develop spiritual qualities, we literally forfeit the purpose of our lives. S Spotlight Show, Artificial Morality. Welcome everyone to Created in the Image of God. We have our first ever spotlight show for you tonight. In the spotlight show, actually, this may be our second, first one that I'm participating in. I'm just recently back from Israel, as some of you know, and we had a spotlight show um, while I was in Israel. A spotlight show is taking a particular topic of, of broad and deep interest and creating an anthology around that show topic. Tonight, we have a very special show for you. The topic is Artificial Morality, Navigating the Ethics of AI with Baha'i Teachings or Religious Teachings. If you're watching live, remember to drop a note in the chat. Let us know that you're here and that you're watching. Also, feel free to post questions, which we can then use during the show or, or possibly bring them on towards the end of the show if we have time and if we have a segment for questions. Let me introduce tonight's special guest who will be joining us here shortly. Mr. Gilbert Hakim is the founder and CEO of SCC Soft Computer. He is widely recognized as a leading figure in the field of laboratory information systems, being at the forefront of innovation in this field since the late 70s. He continues to push the boundaries in genetics-based LIS and workflow automation. And he heads up a company with over 2,000 IT medical technology communications of business professionals, all dedicated to the design, development, delivery, implementation, and support of robust, integrated information management system solutions for the laboratory and the genetics workplace. Certainly, Mr. Hakim has seen a lot of change in his time and has a lot of insight into many of the probing questions that we all have as society continues to advance. Mr. Kim has remained actively involved in all aspects of this company, providing the vision for ongoing product development through his knowledge of IT advancements, the role of molecular di diagnostics, personalized medicine, and the needs of the hospital laboratory. So a wealth of information, and we can't wait to dig into this as it relates to tonight's topic. But I also wanna highlight Mr. Hakim's philanthropist activities. He's dedicated to giving back to the community, and has made many charitable contributions through his uh, Golden Age Foundation. But he has also developed Ocean Library, which we'll be talking about on the show tonight. So without any further introduction, because I could go on and on and on about this man, I'm gonna bring uh, Mr. Akeem into the studio. Good well, evening, everyone. My name is Gilbert Hakeem. Uh, it's pleasure uh, to be with you tonight, and hopefully I can shed some light on some of the newest technologies that exist, uh, an application of it in healthcare as well as uh, social sciences, and how these tools are being used to uh, better uh, human experience and eliminate uh, problems that we all facing in a daily basis. And I'm looking very much forward to uh, a little bit later having our our co-host and producer, Daniel Sanderson, who's up in Canada. He's the founder of PlankSip and he's a philosopher. So I figured the matchup between you in this groundbreaking technology and having a philosopher interview would be the right approach for tonight's show. But I wanna take a couple of moments to introduce you to the audience as, as a person. So I'm gonna ask just a few questions about who and what you are, the experiences sure. that have shaped you as a human being. The first one I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about is just your your very early years, uh, you know, where you were born and um, what your experiences were, your family life in those first 10 to 12 years, those years that, that shape us. And as we become adults, we sometimes don't reflect back 
on how those years have molded and shaped us. But in terms of introducing you to the audience, tell us a little bit about those early formative years. Sure. Uh, I was born in Tehran, Iran, and uh, my mother was French. So from mother's side, uh, uh, she was Catholic, actually. And my father was uh, Baha'i. And of course, I grew up in, in that environment, exposing to be exposed to many different religions. Uh, we had uh, family members that were Muslim, Jewish, uh, uh, Christian, of course, and uh, Baha'is in general. So we get a roundabout uh, uh, knowledge uh, about uh, the sacred text of all religions in general. You grow up speaking French, and, and should we be calling you Gilbert? Uh, my name is Gilbert, but um, I haven't spoken Pers French for probably more than 40 years, so I'm not sure if I remember most of it. <laughs> my undergrad uh, major is in theology, but my minor was in French, and I actually lived briefly in France. I, I didn't know that about you. So you grew up in this somewhat multicultural environment, which probably you know, many Americans wouldn't think of, of Iran in that manner, right? Of having those kinds of influences. Um, so how, how was it that you came to the United States? When did that happen? Well, uh, I went to uh, National University of uh, uh, Iran in, uh, I think it was 1970 uh, to 1974. And ironically, because we were Baha'is, we were discriminated against. And of course, at the time, it was very hard to get even into universities because uh, I remember at the time, they had 8,000 seats in the whole country and 180,000 people would uh, basically go through an exam to get selected to one of these universities. So, uh obviously it was a feat for me to get into a national university and i got scholarship also and i graduated top two from uh, my uh, physics department that i was studying in and of course uh, because of the tight uh, uh, religious doctrine that existed and was seeping into the uh, universities at the time, uh, our parents were trying to push us to go to uh, a free country so we can exercise our uh, religious uh, views without any uh, prejudice. So that's really when it came to United States. Uh, and uh, of course, I didn't know any word of English. Wow. So <laughs> I studied. Uh, went uh, to Vermont in one of the English schools and uh, for a summer. And then I got scholarship from uh, State University of New York in Long Island. Uh, so they paid for, for the food because of my grades, uh, lodging food. And, and of course, uh, tuition was paid for as well. And then I studied uh, first in applied mathematics. I got a degree, master's degree in applied mathematics. And of course, I was a teaching assistant there. So they were paying me $3.60 an hour. <laughs> and uh, then I went and got another master's in computer science. Uh, and I got it once I graduated. Uh, one of my professors asked me to write a basic interpreter for Intel 8008 chip. So I wrote an assembly language application and he sold the, of course, the product for $15,000 to a company called Antel at the time wow. in Long Island. So, so that's how it started uh, generally. So I, I want to take a quick step back from a history perspective. So were you, did you move to the United States before 1979? I believe it was 79 where they had the revolution right. in Iran. Yeah. I but you, but here, you said that that the influences were creeping into the to the educational system prior to that. So there must have been course. a movement going on within the country 
that um, supported then this revolution. Maybe you could just spend a minute. I'm just curious personally about, sure. I've never really thought about what it would have been like in the years leading up to it. We Americans only know about the dramatic event, but not the of cultural course. background. No, we for the first time uh, during the, the last year, uh, I finished about three and a half years by uh, uh, basically undergraduate uh, studies uh, bachelor degree that I got. The last year we saw many of these uh, extremist uh, Muslim with uh, actually veils and, and uh, uh, students that were uh, came, in, came to the university and they were disrupting the classes. You know, we had uh, these, uh, so just, just to make sure that the, the study of people gets disrupted. Uh, so they were showing their force that they are present and uh, they, uh, they're they against uh, education or any sort of uh, non-Muslim activities uh, generally, which was very strange at the time because you come to university to study, not to riot. <laughs> <laughs> so right. it was very strange. And so this political environment was getting developed. And the first thing I did when I came uh, uh, to Kennedy Airport was just kiss the ground that when I left uh, that chaos there, which wow. was completely artificial. Uh, well, people I, I don't know how good they have it here. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. I couldn't agree more. So. I'm I'm reminded when you bring up Intel, right, of Andy Grove, who of course was Hungarian and fled, you know, in World War II. Um, he, as a child, escaped from Nazi persecution, and he has a famous quote, which you're probably familiar with, Andy Grove: um, "Only the paranoid survive." Right. So, <laughs> does that resonate with you, given? your experience coming from Iran in those circumstances or, or what's your sort of basic philosophy um, that's that's leading you forward in in your life and to the successes that you've experienced? Well, uh, generally the uh, uh, the process of uh, of education was very important to me and my family and that was a ticket basically to leave the chaos that would uh, was about to unfold in Iran. And unless you were uh, highly educated, uh, you couldn't really have uh, ability to move because of the cost of living obviously was quite high in the United States and very few families could afford to finance uh, uh, sending their kids. Uh, although at the time uh, wasn't as bad as today, to give you an indication, a dollar was uh, about seven two months. That means uh, it was seven times less expensive than dollar. Now today is is close to forty thousand wow. two months. It's it's one dollar, and you see the uh, ba basket of uh, uh, basically. Persian family has shrunk, Iranian family shrunk. You know, at the time, which is intriguing, uh, at the time, the uh, the income of a uh, per capita income was about $9,000. Today is 3,000 after 44 years. Wow. Now imagine when, when uh, religious uh, doctrine gets mixed with politics, they both get corrupted. <laughs> both politics yes. and the religion gets corrupted. And well, you well, see well, the, the, I, the result of it right now. I can see now we're going to have to have you back on the show to talk about that. You know, created in the image of God, the role of religion in society. Um, this is a topic I'd love to dive into, but instead I'm going to... Um, just highlight this topic of education as a nice segue, the importance of education. And now, of course, um, we're, we're advancing into new fields with artificial intelligence, right? So sure. I'm going to quickly go to a commercial break and play the um, 
spotlight advertisement for the anthology that we're building, which we're having you help us with curating. And when we come back, um, we'll bring you and Daniel back, or you back to the screen with Daniel to dive into that topic. So thank you so much for letting us get to know you a, li a little better, uh, Gilbert. My pleasure. <laughs> Artificial morality. The future of AI is rapidly changing. And with it, the future of humanity. How will we approach this transformative technology? Will we make ethical decisions that shape a bright future for all? Or will we be swayed by greed and self-interest? The world's great spiritual teachings offer a path forward a way to use the tools we create for the betterment of humanity. They remind us that we are all created in the image of God and that our technological advancements must reflect this spiritual reality. In Artificial Morality, navigating the ethics of AI with spiritual teachings, we present a vision of hope where technology serves humanity and not the other way around. Join us as we explore this critical topic through stories of inspiration and hope. To submit your own tale of navigating the ethics of AI and become a part of this groundbreaking anthology, simply email us at info at Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight, uh, Gilbert. My pleasure. Um, it's nice to see you again. I know we we spoke a couple of weeks ago, and uh, yeah, it was a nice uh, it, it was nice to get to know you. And we we spent uh, probably an hour and a half or two hours talking about artificial intelligence. So why don't we just dive right in? And uh, Gilbert, let me ask you a um, very direct question: Morality is it is it possible to have artificial intelligence uh, help us with morality? Of course. The, remember, uh, a person, uh, our minds are subjective. We, we're not an objective machine. So we get influenced by the information that we have and experiences that we have. And of course, narration of the information that reaches us and uh, we react to it. So we don't, our, uh, our brains are not designed like a machine. So we, we can get easily influenced based on uh, information that we receive. So the question really goes back of, can we use a methodology of artificial intelligence to prove actually the moral uh, or ethical, basically, laws are right or wrong. Now, something may be good, but may be unethical. And we may not know unless we, we explore it and apply it. And un unfortunately, by that time, it's too late. So artificial intelligence and machine learning language gives us a tool to gain from the experience of the past with volumes of information that humans cannot process individually. So through that process, we can extract a, a formula that by plugging in different variables, it can tell us whether an axiom, a law, uh, or ethics, whether it's right or wrong. So for example, let's say, uh, equality of gender, right? This is, this is a law, it's a common practice. Uh, the question is that what happens, uh, how can we know whether it's right or wrong? The, the way to do it is very simple in, in an artificial, uh, basically intelligence, which is derived from a machine learning language. So what we do is we come and a spot based on uh, country of origin, based on percentage of uh, males, females of a country, 
based on religious doctrine and superstition that is permeated in, in those countries, how restrictive they are against women, for example. And then we can correlate that to their level of education, level of uh, their uh, financial progress, level of their scientific progress, uh, level of their health progress, and so on. So if you map that within the world and take those combination of age, uh, gender, religion, natural, uh, basically, habitat, uh, let's say, gross natural or product of that country, is failed because very, very obvious that if you, for example, take 50% of your population out of the economy, you're going to have a very poor economy. Right, right. Gilbert, I think I understand where you're going with this. Um, but what is your like what is your feeling about this being primarily a secular claim? I mean, it it from from my vantage point, and it's just an initial reaction, but the um the secular community seems to take ownership to that potential upside, right? And it seems to me pulling some of the uh the ownership or the equity that religious institutions have had in the past based off of the collection of data interpreting interpreting you know large swath, swaths of socioeconomic data right this is this seems to be something that is being pushed or advocated for almost maybe not directly but indirectly against uh, religion is that how do you see that well remember the basis of all the religions are one and the same i mean no religion uh, advocates unethical behavior of any kind so the key is uh prog progression of religion itself where of course based on socioeconomic of uh the old ages versus uh, when we were living in caves and living in communes. Ironically, which was very interesting, when they did excavations, they found out even the primitive man, they were, uh, they had graves and they were, uh, they, they were putting monuments on the graves. So they had this notion of a creator was even from beginning although it may have been uh, not a monotheic religion at the time, but this concept of, of a superior uh, creator uh, was even with us from beginning of a civilization in general. So, so progression of religion, the ethics of it really hasn't changed from that perspective. The question becomes application of the uh, the ethics itself. For example, when we're talking about revelation, revelation of, for example, Buddha, Krishna, uh, Zoroaster, uh, uh, let's say G Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and Baha'u'llah. So all these revelations are uh, a set of instructions or laws that can through artificial intelligence, you can actually prove it to be correct. But you have to differentiate revelation, uh, like Bible, uh, from the adherence of the religion itself. So religions are a byproduct or an application of revelation between humans. So it's a, it's a man-made uh, basically entity that is subject to laws of thermodynamics, which any, any uh, closed system, when it uses its internal energy, it basically disappears. It falls apart. Unless there is outside the system, there is an infusion of energy that make it grow. 
So when you're looking at civilization as, as, a, as a general uh, model, it's defined the second law of term, thermodynamics. And why is it growing all the time? It's supposed to die. Today, for example, based on laws of thermodynamics, we know billions of years from now, our sun is going to extinguish and become a supernova. We can even tell it fairly accurately when it's going to happen in the future. That means any element in the whole universe follows these laws. How come civilization is defying it? And the reason is this infusion of, of the uh, ethics or moral standard that comes through revelation to humanity. And it causes jump in civilization. Yeah, um, well, I'm, I want to push back a little bit in, in, or, and, and get some clarification as to why humanity seems to be defying these odds. Because if I'm reading between the lines, I think that there's... Um, that's, that's probably where you uh, uh, find your faith, and I'm just I'm guessing. Uh, but I think I think that we as a, as the as sapiens are incredibly um, adaptive, but we are one species. And just to, to give you a comparison, of course, by biomass, an ant has the same biomass as humans on the planet. So whatever metric we're actually using thriving dominant species on a planet, you could put the ant species as uh, plural, as um, as something that rivals the human species, right? Now, they're automatons, they've got, um, I think, 15,000 species, right? Um, right? Possibly even more, but we've got one species, right? I mean, one species. And so... To me, I feel that we're fragile in terms of being one species, right? That that uh, the threat of an extinction could um, be more real than it, it it could be for a different species that has or you know multiple species, right? So what are what are your thoughts of, of that about how successful we are? Like, uh, and and to pull back to the original part of the question, Gilbert, do you think that? Um, we are an exceptional species guided, um, and that explanation is being guided by a higher power. Is that the totality of where you would answer that? Yeah. Remember, we're the only species that has consciousness. There is no other species on Earth that has consciousness. And that's what differentiates us from other species that exist. Of course, we all started from uh, a single cell uh, basically uh, create creation uh, that uh, ended up through uh, evolution. But when you're looking at species, when the combination of the material uh, elements chemically combined, life started to get created. So the question really is that from perspective of the human species, let's let's look at, for example, from mid 1800s. Uh, if you look at the progress of civilization, going back to that subject, 92% of of the population of the Earth. You're talking about maybe 150, couple of hundred years, uh, 150, 170 years ago. 90. 2% of the population couldn't read or write. Hmm. Now you have a completely different environment. The, the chance of a uh, basically newborn to reach five years old was only 30%. Yeah. So when you're looking at the advancement in sciences, uh, and uh, basically healthcare, uh, food production, uh, industrialization, all these events occur. Well, why didn't it occur 300 years ago? 
mm. 500 years ago. So you see these cycles that are occurring, the same thing that happened during the uh, basically uh, when uh, Muhammad brought in the Islam and the main reason actually Islam spread throughout the world was because spiritually he enforced uh, breaking down the caste system that existed in the world at the time. That's why uh, people have, are under this impression that uh, most of the, the Islam was spread through sword, which wasn't the case actually. There were about seven, 8,000 nomads with, uh, with swords and they brought down over 100,000 uh, basically soldiers of the Persian empire. How could this happen? And the reason was that whenever they were attacking a particular city or, or uh, province, people themselves wanted to get rid of their own ex ecclesiastical system that created that caste system to free them from that uh, process. Even for example, when you're looking at Jerusalem, the, um, the Jews were uh, inviting Muslims because of the uh, pressure that they were in and they were looking at at the Muslims or as a liberator of the Palestine at the time, because they were under uh, the influence of Rome, uh, Roman Empire from that perspective. And of course, uh, uh, Roman was using the whole Roman Empire was financed by Egyptian slaves and uh, Middle Eastern basically uh, slaves. Uh, that's how they were financing their, their wars with Persian Empire. But when you're looking at uh, what happened uh, in 670 AD, and suddenly this Islamic culture grew to a point where uh, by, I think was uh, uh, 12, 11th or 12th century, uh, it was dominant, it was golden ages of the uh, Islamic civilization. Well, algebra was invented, uh, their chess was invented, uh, the number zero was invented. So it's many of these sciences. As a matter of fact, there are um, a scholar, uh, Islamic scholars of the time, their uh, their books was 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 in use up to about 100, 120 years ago. Mm. It's, it's really intriguing how uh, that civilization uh, grew. And of course, during that period, Europe was in dark ages. Of course, it wasn't because sun wasn't out. It's because the ecclesiastical structure of, of uh, Christianity hijacked the political system and kept people in dark. Uh, well, let's let's pause there for a minute because you're 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 covering a lot of territory that that we could well, spend. Yeah, we could spend well, many 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 uh, hours going going down. Um, sure. So let, let, let's focus a little bit on on uh, the more on morality and where is derived because on, on one hand i can i can say that morality is derived from the consciousness which is that god-given gift that you refer to cool. uh, that makes us unique it is the light it is uh it is the ghost in the machine it is what makes me me and you you um so how do you get that into and and I and I think I know where you're going to go with this. You you say you have inductive based models, where you look at um, a historical past, collect information, and try and predict the future based off of things that happened in the past. That is an inductive model of reasoning for people that don't know philosophy or computer science. But there's other forms of reasoning. So hopefully you can go into that. And basically, I'm wondering how do you get the ghost into the machine. How do you teach 
artificial intelligence, and I mean even general artificial intelligence, is that even possible to put that into uh, in, into a computer program or into uh, a, a humanoid-like uh, creation, uh, well, Android, if you will? That's correct. Remember, artificial intelligence doesn't invent anything new. What it does is crunches the information to find a pattern within the events that occurred in the past. So for example, let's say a patient shows up in the emergency room and uh, normally what they do is uh, they do a, a urine test and they basically take uh, uh, for microbiology, they take a sample of the blood and put it into a dish and send it to the lab to be processed. Of course, it takes uh, almost uh, probably between three to eight hours to get the result back. Now, they found that if they can detect the sepsis, the first half an hour of, of patient in the emergency room and sending them to the ICU, the survival rate would be 80%. If it goes beyond 30 minutes and you take the patient after, let's say, one hour, the survivability drops to actually 20%. Mm -hmm. So the artificial intelligence comes into play by creating a formula that can use the result of the urine test itself of component, chemical components of the urine test based on formula and factor and looking at tens of thousands of the patients that had similar co chemical com combination that had actually sepsis, uh, mm -hmm. then they can tell the, by doing a test through artificial intelligence and this machine le learning language that took all the information about these maybe 100,000 patients with different chemical combination to tell whether this patient is going to survive and they have to ship him to the ICU immediately versus mm -hmm. him lingering around waiting for the uh, microbiology department to give a result after, let's say, eight hours. So mm -hmm. this is really a, a, a use of it in, uh, in healthcare that mm -hmm. is uh, basically uh, uh, is being used in general or detect, uh, for example, heart attack based on your vital sign, your, uh, let's say, uh, genetics background your uh, pedigree of, of the patient means aunt's uncle uh, history of heart attack, you can plug this information into the formula and the system would tell you whether you're going to have a heart attack within the next 48 hours or not. Yeah, so those are two really, the, yeah, those are two really good examples, Gilbert. And um, I think Gilbert's oversimplifying that you can just plug them in. I mean, I mean, there is an interface and, and it can be quite an elaborate one. Um, and the bigger the programs, the more elaborate the interface. But um, I think that's a really important part of the conversation. Uh, it, it makes me think of an emergency room situation. And there's something, there's something comforting about that if you're faced with a tough decision that a doctor can say, okay, well, we can do A, B, or C, 20%, 30%, here are the risks. Like to have that information is so valuable. And um, I, we're, gonna, we're gonna dig into this a little more um, about the marriage between technology, artificial intelligence, and the human species right after this break. Sure. And welcome to Something or Other Publishing, or as our friends like to call us, Soup. Soup is a platform that connects authors, readers, and service providers in one convenient place. 
Choose Soup if you're an author with a great book idea and you're looking for a publisher offering hands-on coaching in some of the best royalties in the business. Or if you're a reader who enjoys engaging with celebrated and emerging authors. We already have over 3,000 of them and more are joining every day. You can even win free books by voting on their book ideas. Or maybe you're a service provider and you're looking to engage with over 3,000 authors. We're here to help. So whether you're an author, a reader, or a service provider, you're in the right place at Soup. Contact us at help at soupllc.com to learn more. Okay, welcome back. I'm with Gilbert Hakim, and uh, before we went to commercial break, we were we were talking about the healthcare system, and and I confessed something to the audience that I feel comfortable, uh, or I feel comfortable with information, uh, and being given the ability to make a decision uh, in in a tough situation like an emergency room visit. Gilbert, uh, what are your thoughts? Is this how you envision artificial intelligence working well with humans? Yeah, this is one of the uh, reasons to use artificial intelligence. Remember, our resources are limited. So you have to be highly accurate. Highly accurate means that better than 99% that this per per person has sepsis or not. Otherwise, you would send people that are don't have that to the uh, ICU, and then you you run out of ICUs very quickly. Mm -hmm. So you see the the application of AI and machine learning language in terms of getting defining the variables and coefficient of those variables that gives us a formula for a binary decision. Mm -hmm. Is, is this patient sepsis or not? Yeah. And it's, yeah, same process actually applies into uh, application of uh, in uh, artificial intelligence in uh, social sciences. It's called sociodynamics, for example. That means that you create models, and there is many different uh, use of it today. And although we uh, travel in our highways and, and roads uh, and uh, visit uh, red lights and green lights, and we think everything runs smooth, but in the behind that, there is actually a logistic model, mm -hmm. which is an artificial intelligence that has a model that they have defined in the context of sociodynamics or behavior of humans based on time of the day, uh, basically day of the week, uh, congestion and uh, certain events, maybe football game. How do they manage these red lights and green lights to not create gridlocks in the society? So. Uh, logistic models uh, applies to, for example, how a town grows, what elements make a town grow, and attraction of people to this town, and of course, eventually it will go into saturation. And they use those models to see how many roads do they, do they need. Do they need schools because of the child uh, varying age uh, uh, females. So these are really key elements that artificial intelligence can predict the needs of the society or community in the future, and they can plan for it. So we don't get into an environment which it takes five hours to go to work every day. Yeah. So these yeah. are the key elements. That's one use of the uh, artificial intelligence in sociodynamics called logistic model. Then you have diffusion model. Diffusion model is basically like disease. How does disease spread? Uh, rumors, uh, norms, technologies, knowledge. How does it dissipate? Progresses. And all these things have uh, these machine learning language 
because they have history and they can uh, monitor progress of the disease and the spread of a disease, they can fine tune the model by feeding it more and more information. Then later on, they can use it for predicting if a new pandemic occurs, how would it spread? Mm -hmm. And this is the use of artificial intelligence, uh, which is called diffusion model. Then you have a gravity model, which is uh, basically uh, migration of people from one state to the other. Uh, traffic volume, for example, that we discussed. These are gravity models. So these are all using machine learning language and artificial intelligence to help us uh, manage the growth of the society and uh, the conveniences that we uh, enjoy today. And then you have the, the other model is game theory, which is social uh, cooperation, social competition, uh, optimum economic outcome. So when you look in as Wall Street, this game theory model is in, in use. And uh, the computers are making those decisions. That's why it's very difficult to go against machines that are making the trades. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the retail investor is at a loss. Uh, they don't understand what is happening. But all of those calculations are done with uh, high-speed uh, uh, fiber network uh, computers that tells them when to buy, when to sell, who the market maker is. So all these are really game theory and follows the same model in terms of uh, defining variables, whether it's uh, emotional, political, uh, laws of uh, uh, demand, so yeah, that's very that's that's very interesting. I I think um, I'd like to take this a little bit of a different direction, but related to the the very first example you gave in the traffic light situation, they the the traffic lights and those intricate those intricate uh, algorithms uh, that are constantly running in the background of our uh, of our urban uh, movement. <laughs> This is uh, quite fascinating. Uh, I think um, if people stop and consider what actually has to uh, happen in some of these complex spaghetti junctions or um, uh, you know busy intersections, it's quite it's quite fascinating. Um, I wanted to bring Elon Musk into the equation, uh, sure. and, and probably not in the way we you initially know. had talked, but. Sure. Elon, I want to talk about the autonomous cars for a minute. And sure. this came just, up. Just one second. I just want to add something very important. Mm -hmm. By invention of uh, GPS, basically, and your cell phone in your car, the model doesn't have to be static, that you're predicting an event in a particular time of the day. Mm the information can be completely online. That means the, the volume of cars that are coming in can be fed into the computer and the decisions are made in, in microseconds of how to turn the lights on or off. So it hmm. doesn't have to be a static formula. It can be a dynamically uh, running algorithm that is completely adjusting itself as it goes on right right okay so, so what go ahead I I just, no but i think what gilbert was trying to do is make an, a, a very um important distinction when i had said algorithm it's so much more complex than a simple a b c d uh it's right. uh it's more like a markov chain uh or uh something that's feeding in on itself and changing uh through time in a multi in multiple different ways um, so yeah, my apologies and thank you, Gilbert, for, for catching that. Um, so the, the ethical question that I want to bring up is that there appears to be a double standard with deaths in an automobile. Now, we're not in the age where we have autonomous cars 
Elon Musk's plan hasn't materialized as fast as he envisioned. But he basically was um, hopeful that we would be, um, well, I guess it's the vision that he painted, that we would all be behind cars that drove themselves, right? And so we wouldn't have to actually command a vehicle to go to work, go to school, drop kids off or uh, go on road trips or this kind of thing. So there appears to be a bit of a double standard, right? So if, if, if heaven forbid, I got into an accident and um, uh, my, kid, my kids were hurt or something like that, that would be absolutely horrific. But imagine how do you assign blame to a probability or to a program? Um, and it's not so much, it's like, I mean it from a cathartic sort of standpoint of blame. Like I can I can absorb and put that weight on my shoulders, but sure. how, how do you reconcile that that was the machine? Like it, it it's really, to me, it feels really, uh, feels like a huge mountain for people to climb. Um, if they're behind and they have control, even if even if the probabilities of survival are less under human control, it feels like that's something that people will be hesitant to give up. What what are your thoughts about that? Well, we need to define it first. What it is. First of all, the angle of view that you have is at best about ninety degrees that you can see on your front of it. That events that are occurring within ninety. Uh, degrees of your eyesight when you're then, driving the car right correct yeah that, okay. that's the case now imagine a, a tesla car or a, other cars they have probably close to eight to ten eyes not mm. two they have ten eyes in 360 degrees so mm. they can detect elements of danger way before the human being can mm -hmm. so from a mathematical point of view, where there is noise of a breaking car behind you, which you can't hear, but the computer does hear it, and actually accelerate your car when it hears a, somebody breaking uh, in the back because they may cause an accident and you shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. So variable of decision making is 100 times faster and more elements the computer can cover than humans do mm. now there are many different methods uh, of detecting uh, a human or avoiding an accident but imagine that it's two o'clock in the morning and you had a very heavy dinner and you had a couple of glasses your response times cannot match Mm -hmm. uh, a car that always behaved the same way. Now, obviously, there may be glitches uh, within the uh, application, which is very rare, or uh, an, a malfunction of the mechanical parts that can cause an accident. But the ratio of the accidents that can occur because of the failure of the application or mechanical failure is basically 10 times less than a human being behind the, the wheel. So the moral standard is, is irrefutable that a autonomous car is safer than, than humans are. Yeah, no, I, I get that, but I just feel that I can anticipate a pushback because people will, individuals will be experiencing that and they will reconcile that with if I was in that situation, I could have done something differently. Um, but remember, you see, you're, you're, you're talking about a, an adult uh, in middle ages that is behind the car and has all his attention. But we have 16 year old that doing test texting and driving at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to be subject to it regardless, <laughs> whether you're, you're smart or not smart, or you're older, uh, we have uh, problems with the uh, aged, uh, aged people in Florida that uh, mm -hmm. they get into accident. And by the way, your insurance reflects that as well. But the, the, the whole issue is that you can avoid all these problems. And uh, ironically, 
uh, in uh, I think mid 1900s, uh, the uh, science of uh, thermodynamics, the uh, statistical uh, prediction uh, of quantum mechanics seeped into uh, basically sociodynamics. Mm -hmm. So quantum mm -hmm. mechanics is based on uh, behavior of the uh, molecular level or atomic level of the uh, basically uh, any uh, material. And everything is a statistics. And what it promotes is very intriguing. You, you may open the door from your house, step outside, there is a minute chance you end up in Paris. <laughs> well, you see, that's what, yeah. what it is. Mm -hmm. So everything is a statistical uh, event that can occur. And the same, uh, basically, quantum mechanics can be applied to within sociodynamics that we just discussed on the decision model. One of the other elements that we discussed beside the game theory is called decision model. How do humans make decision? Because we're, we're, uh, we're an analog machine. We're not a real uh, computer that behaves the same way all the time. And obviously, if you cover all the areas that an accident can, can occur, and you have defense against it, chances of survival is 100 times better than mm. a human uh, that may be tired, may be under influence, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Just uh, take uh, alcohol, for example. This is a very good example where uh, we try to eliminate it uh, in, of course, early 1900, and we weren't successful. But in reality, alcohol is causing so much damage to the society uh, so it's really morally wrong although you can say uh, this body belongs to me and i'm in charge of it and i can do anything i want with it as long as i don't harm other people but guess what if you drink and sit behind a car you're gonna cause 40,000 deaths that is occurring in the united states every year Mm -hmm. That's four times Vietnam War occurring every year in the United States, and nobody says anything because to our psyche, it's impossible to solve this problem. So we don't think about it, but it's morally wrong because yeah. it's causing, causing harm to the society. So yeah. your body, although it's yours, but it's a unit of labor of the society that has to... to provide uh, services to move civilization. So it's not just only yours. Mm -hmm. And this is really the concept which is really different when you're dealing with a so secular society and you take ethics out of it. And this is what you get. Very interesting. Very interesting. We have a, um, we do have time for a break. And I, I'm, sure. I'm wondering if one of our uh, most dedicated fans might be able to join us in, in bringing up the conversation and bring the show back to a religious um, and put some religious depth back into the show. Um, sure. This this fan is named Wade. So we'll see if he pops back in. Guys, watch for it. we got a commercial break coming up right now. Uh, and uh, who knows what you see when you come back. Okay, hold on. Discover the world's religious traditions like never before with Ocean 2.0 Reader. Our custom ebook reader is designed for exploration and study. With an immersive audio integrated reading experience and powerful research tools. Available on all platforms including web, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, and iOS. Experience the benefits of immersive reading by combining ear and eye and improve comprehension and vocabulary acquisition and with our interfaith library featuring books from Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, Jainism, Confucianism, 
Buddhism, Taoism, Christianity, Islam, and Baha'i. You'll have access to a wealth of knowledge. Try Ocean 2.0 Reader today and elevate your reading experience. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Well, look Great. what we have here. We have we have Wade back in studio. Wade, I'm glad you could join us. Um, how have you Thanks been? Thanks for inviting me back in. I was actually um, really just listening. This was an amazing conversation. And uh, it was really nice to not have to be participating and just to listen and reflect on this. Um, I have been noticing some of the questions in the comments. A couple of them popped up on screen. Um, I'm going to just show one of them here and then le lead into um, a question here. So um, <clears throat> this is actually somebody that I've met in the last week. Um, I'm going to see if I can get his name. Mikaya, I believe, is how he pronounces it. And he is the founder of interfaithlibrary.com. He will actually be our guest on next week's show. So I thought we'd introduce him here by saying, by his comment, I can somewhat see its use in tangible applications. But how would AI work in non-tangible space, such as interfaith or multi-faith cooperation? We are talking about morality and ethics. And kind of as an add-on to that, this article that um, we used as part of the research for this that came out about Elon Musk's efforts. Um, there was a pastor who was saying that he could see, first of all, that this development is going to happen where, you know, we have artificial intelligence embedded in our, in our world. And Elon Musk was saying, you know, when you use, when you use this thing, you know, day in, day out, that's my daughter here who's saying she's trapped in the phone. That's uh, she, she, uh, she did that to my phone. Help, I'm trapped in your phone. Um, but we have this with us all the time, and we're, we're using it to access information and guide us. I, I can't go anywhere without it on the road these days. Um, and and we're, we're using it to interact with other people through calling. And so we're progressing. Artificial intelligence is happening, and it's becoming embedded in the human experience. And this one pastor was saying, hey, no problem, as long as we use uh, the Christian teachings, right? So there you go, right? The devil is in the details, uh, pun intended. And, um, you know, Micaiah was saying, how do we, you know, infuse morality and ethics into artificial intelligence when we, we're not even really in agreement as a, as a species on what those key moral and ethical issues are? No, of course. But remember, uh, the basic banner of the uh, civilization uh, and uh, unity of mankind, start of it was, I think it was 1946 when United Nations was formed and 19, I think it was 60, 1940. Is 48, where the uh, individual rights, uh, human rights was passed. Yeah, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's Same right. year that the state of Israel was founded. We've talked about that extensively on this show. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So when you're looking at the edicts of that, uh, basically, document, I think it was Ele Eleanor Roosevelt, was, which was championing that, and got it signed. And 180 countries today have a signatory to that document. But when you look at gist of it, every one of them believes at, or believed in those, uh, I think, uh, close to 30 uh, items within that uh, declaration. But when you're looking at application, of those laws, majority of the countries are violating them. So the key really creation of or knowledge of ethical behavior is within us. And it comes from uh, all religion, basically, that built that cohesive knowledge that created that document in uh, 1948. 
But reality is that uh, freedom of speech. Do we have freedom of speech today? You know, freedom of uh, basically. Uh, right. There, there's another comment um, from A.M. Sterling. I showed this a little while ago. Are there any concerns about bias creeping into AI systems? Right. Uh, Elon Musk has purchased Twitter. Why? Because I, I suspect one of the reasons is he felt that a bias had crept into Twitter and he exposed that bias through the Twitter files. And Matt Taibbi, who I've been a fan of going back, you know, went two decades almost when he started writing in the Rolling Stone magazine and was just this firebrand journalist who, you know, frankly, he was, you know, very much on the liberal side, which Rolling Stone magazine. Um, and uh, yet he he now is, you know, looking into Twitter with Elon Musk and exposing how bias crept in and how uh, government agencies or even furthering that bias as to which speech should be allowed and which speech should not be allowed, right? So this is a risk and concern. How, how do we protect against, you know, they say there's this old saying, you know, to, to get things, you know, it's to air is human, but to really screw things up, you need a computer, right? How That's do we right. get it from getting worse, not better? Yeah, remember this social media, because it's not regulated, their main goal, ironically, now we see polarization in the uh, American society, but this is really byproduct of the social media itself, because it's neither left or right, it's actually amoral, although when we're looking at it from a left, we say, oh, oh uh, it's uh, leaning toward left. Or when you're from right, we're, we're seeing that there are too many people agreeing with us on the right. But reality is that, that uh, social media is amoral. The only goal they have is to keep their uh, people that are uh, subscribing to them into the fold to sell them advertising. But to sell advertising, you need to create this unity. You need to basically create different groups that have a different buying patterns. That, and to do this, the same social media feeds left to the, uh, to the liberal group and right conservative to the right group, same social, same social media. And the reason they do this is because they want to keep them back into their fold. And humans nature is that if you see tens of thousands of people, they agree with you, you think that uh, you, it reinforces your own idea, but you have no idea how the other group are thinking because you never see it. They don't even present it to you. So social media is immoral and their only need to create profit for themselves by keeping you within the uh, basically Facebook or Twitter and or so on and so forth. So polarization of United States is not by accident or we became polarized. It's the byproduct of basically segregation of society whether it's political, gender, color, uh, or religious. They mm -hmm. want to seg compartmentalize people into different areas so they can go to the advertiser and say, look, I have found this group that has this type of buying pattern and these are their beliefs. Yep, so to, to clarify a couple of things, when you use the term amoral, you're not saying immoral. You're not saying that social media is immoral, but rather that it has it has no morality. It is it is it is in a sense a Frankenstein monster in that it's a creation of people who themselves have a profit motive, right? So it exactly it powerfully pursues the intent of its creator, which is to make money. 
And Correct. this is the beauty of that Frankenstein story, right? Technology was harnessed, um, but then it took off in a direction that was unintended. And yet we see the intent behind it in reality, right? The, the, the corporation becomes, in a sense, an entity that has agency. And it also is, it, it can grow very large and very powerful because it also has, it has legal rights and it's protected. But it can relentlessly pursue the goals of its founders, right? And th the goal is to make money. money. And, it does, it, and it is amoral, right? Correct. But remember, you see, people think that the news that they hear is the truth. But how could how could a social media have two versions of the truth for two different groups? Right, because it's selling to two. It's it's um, it is not only dividing them into groups, but it's creating a desire, a need, a want, right, for information that they can provide by by creating that division, right. They can sell to both groups, is what you're saying. Of course, that's that's the reason that they exist uh, in general. And by amping up the respective echo chambers on either side, they're creating more demand for that type of information. It's a kind of crack cocaine of information is what it is. Correct. I, I got to push back a little bit on this, you guys, because it, it sounds like if it's such a bad thing, then why don't we just turn it off? But you can't. That's the whole point. You yeah, see, the, re the reason is that we are human and this is coming from our desire, right? Uh, so so I want to throw this out there, um, Gilbert, and see how you respond to this. There's the there's the possibility that this artificial, if you will, or an external input has more objectivity than we do. Right. Because you, you mentioned alcohol as a great example. And, and guess what? I suffered from that. My mother was an alcoholic. So that part was resonating with me. You know, somebody should have done something. Right. Somebody should have done something because. Um, you know, my family was destroyed by it and, you know, me and my sisters and whatnot and many, many other millions of people. But but nobody's going to do something because it's what the people want. The people want it. And so therefore it's allowed and others exploit their weaknesses and their desires for profit or power. Of course. See, the, the reality is that when the social networks are unregulated, if you look at the population of Facebook, there are 2 billion people on Facebook. Now, if you look at the best uh, newspaper, you're looking at daily uh, use of maybe 100,000, 200,000. That's it. Right. But the, but the real issue that we're seeing now in society globally is that the regulators are no better and sometimes worse than those that they're trying to regulate. Isn't that the essential mm. problem that we have? Well, this is the it. point of the Twitter files, for example, is that, yes, it was. It was being regulated, and as it became regulated, it was turned into something even worse than it was before. I don't believe they're, they're, they're not under the same regulation as newspaper or cable news. They're not. They're immune from it. So they can say anything they want to anybody they want, and they can't, you cannot sue them. So they can create realities. By the way, they have another... Uh, reinforcement uh, called bots. <laughs> These are actually uh, non-human uh, registered uh, basically users that through computer they generate opinions and then they resonate with people. And people think, look, there are 100,000 people think like me. But maybe 90% of them are actually computers that are feeding you information to reinforce that you're a good, good person. Your ideas are great. Hmm. It's bot, right? B-O-T is what you were, you were referring That's to? Right. Yeah. It's the, uh, it, instead of robots, they call it bots. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's the, it's the application of artificial intelligence. 
of course that's they're in they're in the rub with this whole topic right <laughs> because the, so and and who controls the artificial intelligence and how do we how do we ensure right that it gets applied properly so i don't i don't know that we're going to resolve this tonight it sounds like we're going to have to have you back and maybe start from this point and dive into the, the maybe some some pra practical applications. I know that you have um, created Ocean 2.0. We we showed an ad for that a little while ago. Maybe that would be a good place to sort of wrap up for today. What what is your vision for Ocean 2.0, and how can that be? Is it a stepping stone to what you're referring to, or is it something separate and independent that you've created? Of course, the the key really is the the truth and uh, moral standard comes from revelation not from religion but revelation which is bible quran Agdas from baha'is you have amen uh, we're unapologetic about that on this show right <laughs> no no we, that's talk, we talk about we talk about the two books of revelation right we have we have the revealed word and then we have frankly, the greater revelation, which is the creation itself. And, and it's been my position that science is only beginning. It's at the infancy of being able to read that second great book of revelation, the creation itself. It's almost as though we're just now learning the alphabet. And people think science is so advanced and they trust the science, but we, we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what science, the potential that science has to understand, as Einstein said, the thoughts of God. Basically, about 20, very, 20 years ago with uh, Chad Jones, uh, which is one of my friends and colleagues that worked with us, we actually did an experiment that was very successful. So we took four books and we took uh, kids from 11 to 17 and put them in uh, uh, in a bunch of uh, uh, condos and force them to read, <laughs> read and listen for 10 hours a day. As a parent, I'm going to be sending you my kids. Thank you. But, but <laughs> no, please continue. Was, <laughs> we were, they were sleeping in the condos. We were feeding them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They were not allowed to call their parents. So the only way they could communicate was through social media with their parents uh, and their experiences. And the rate of uh, absorption of the information that was in these four books was 10 times higher than just a person reading it themselves. So what we figured out is that we automate this. Well, you have uh, billions the people in the world, how could you have them this experience uh, when you actually see the letters and you hear, you register 10 times better and retain it 10 times better. So that's really where, uh, of course, as you know, one of our uh, uh, edicts of the Baha'i religion is move toward common language around the world. So we said that obviously English is the, the primary language currently spoken all ar around the world. By the way, soon we have more English uh, speaking people in Asia than we would have in the Western society. So this is spreading quite, quite rapidly. So what we did is that for third world countries, we de developed this application where we we took analog voice of a human being, a storyteller. So people that listen to it, they don't get tired and they want to learn more. And of course, showing the letters, uh, letters of, of the book, and you can stop it, you can press on it, you can uh, have a dictionary opening up, telling you what the meaning of that word is. So. How about teaching English through Bible to people? And that's really what, uh, or uh, Islamic book or Baha'i books or, or well, so this now, now the I, whole now idea. I, now I have to tell you a story in support of it. I mentioned at the beginning of the show, my, my undergrad degree, major in theology, minor in French. I purchased 
the Bible in French. And I would play those old cassette tapes as I was going to sleep at night on my Walkman, right? And by virtue of playing in French, the, you know, the verses that I partially knew or knew their content, um, I accelerated my French learning and was then accepted to the French language program. Even though when I, when I took college French, I was first year French and some of them have had had four years in high school, but I quickly accelerated beyond some of them. There may have also been some natural talent, but so I, I'm just resonating with what you're saying and enhanced reading experience as to how that can dramatically accelerate the learning capability of the students in the program. No, this is really critical in terms of seeing the actually word itself and being able to see the meaning of it without going sideways, opening up a dictionary. So you can actually see what it is and you can hear it. Uh, but uh, the, the difficult portion was it took us almost seven years to really take the analog voice of a human being and then match it to the words itself. So you're hearing a, a fantastic story. So we hired bunch of uh, Shakespearean actors to read those books. And, uh, you know, it gets you excited into the story itself. So it's similarly, someone wants to learn Arabic, they can go and, and read Quran. And so these are revelations of God that unfolded through, throughout history of mankind or Buddhism or Jainism and so on and so forth. So this was really the key to having multiple languages. We have, uh, even in Portuguese, we have some. Uh, you can read uh, basically uh, sacred books in Portuguese for that matter. So these are really key elements which, um, which help propagate both English and other languages through the revelation of God. Wonderful. Well, um, <clears throat> Gilbert, it's been just an absolute pleasure having you on the show. So grateful that you came and shared some of the things you're working on, some of the ideas that you have. Um, love to have you back in the future to learn more about that. And of course, we thank you for your support of this show. We we will continue to you know showcase the um, the anthology idea that we're hoping to build, as well as the um, the Ocean 2.0. We'll look forward to keeping tabs on the development of, and the rollout of that as that goes along. Um, anything that you'd like to conclude with tonight, um, I'll just mention again, next week's guest will be um, Micaiah, who is the founder of Interfaith Library, and we'll look forward to having him on. But um, what, what parting words of wisdom or you know remaining comments that you're thinking of as I'm doing my little ending monologue here would you like to leave our audience with tonight? Sure. First, I just want to mention the uh, Ocean 2 uh, Interfaith uh, Reader is free of charge. You can download it into from the uh, App Store. Uh, so it's completely free of charge and it, it should be read and used uh, uh, for improving your language of choice for that matter. Now, uh, we were discussing, for example, uh, these infusion of the uh, basically uh, development of revelation um, itself. I guess, I guess, I guess that's it right there. I'm, I'm going to download it right now. Unfortunately, it's, um, it's not, uh, it's yeah. blurry, but there it is. That's how quick I'm getting it right now. Yeah, S similar to. Uh, jump in civilization that occurred during Islamic era, and now you see the religion of Islam is in decline. Uh, generally, the the revelation of Baha'u'llah that came in mid 1800 infused that energy into the world, dissipated the moral and ethical standard that now shows up in. Declaration of Human Rights in United Nations. And of course, the Baha'i religion was the first NGO of United Nations that helped draft that uh, document. 
Yeah, when I was in Israel, um, I went to the Baha'i World Center and they introduced this welcome center that I had not seen before, built into Mount Carmel. And as I was, and they just all this display of everything related to the Baha'i faith. But I noticed over in one corner, they had that draft document on display from 1946. And I was not aware of that. We've talked on this show on past shows. My belief that Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he will judge the nations. And I've shared my perspective that the way in which that judgment is occurring, because Matthew, the book of Matthew starts out with this idea that we should not judge and that according to whatever standard of judgment we set up, that is how God is going to judge us. And it occurred to me, well, the standard that has been set up globally is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Because I was asking the question, how, how exactly will the Son of Man, when he comes in his glory, judge the nations? How will he actually judge the nations? Well, they have set up their own standard by which that judgment will occur in the fact that they all signed on to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And as you read further in Matthew 25, the kinds of things that the Son of Man, when he comes in his glory, will use to judge those nations, he separates them like sheep from goats. And the decision is, did you give a glass of water to the thirsty? Did you feed the hungry? Did you clothe the naked? Did you establish a, a just system to visit them when they're sick? and to treat them with equity when they're in prison. At the national level, this standard is documented in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And as you mentioned, far too many nations are miserably failing in delivering these basic, these basic uh, human rights, if you will. Um, and they, these nations have that responsibility to their citizens. And they've signed up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and, and that judgment is occurring on an ongoing basis. Yeah, of course. That's one of the reasons, actually, humanity is go, going toward irreligion because of the abuse of the ecclesiastical systems in terms of, uh, in the name of God or revelation, causing harm. Right. And, you know, they're, they're all causing harm. The ones who have thrown off religion, frankly, I would submit that they are causing more harm. But there's something even worse when you do it in the name of your God, when you explicitly, oh, because now you're putting, you're putting your bad behavior on God and you are turning people away from God because you are so grossly misrepresenting God. It's the first commandment, uh, you know, that Moses brought down from Sinai, right? Uh, you know, not taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain, not applying his name to that which you are doing. Of course. I think so, <laughs> sorry. So, um, you, you, you were, you were, um, uh, talking though. I'm sorry, I went off on this tangent about. Matthew 25, judging the nations because of something that you were saying about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I probably took you off the track as to why you were bringing that up. No, no, it's the, the key really is that, for example, when you're looking at uh, sciences, which we believe is parallel to revelation, these are wings of the same bird, and they have no conflict whatsoever between them. And through mathematics, actually, minimalism is a good example that proves the existence of God with mathematics, actually. Uh, Dr. William Hatcher uh, was the philosopher of the second part of 20th century. Uh, through minimalism proved existence of God, uh, which is uh, basically a unique uh, God which uh, the creator of all the uh, heavens and, and whatever material there is. So these are really proven environments, but reality is that nobody really remembers 
for example, whether uh, Newton was Christian or Jewish, they used the science that he brought in. Same way Einstein, nobody cares what religion he has. They're using the science uh, that he brought uh, to better uh, humanity in general. Revelation is the same way. Although some of these uh, declaration of uh, human rights were revealed during 1800, it's irrelevant basically what the source of it was. Reality is that that is the Holy Spirit for today. And people do agree with it, but they don't comply with it. And no, people recognize it. Jesus yeah. said, my servants will hear my voice. People recognize it. Yeah, but we don't we don't follow it. We don't Correct. we don't submit to the revelation of God. We want to vain imagination and idle fancy that we can somehow exist outside the framework that God has created. Well, the, the, the biggest one, for example, is the first religion by religion that abolished slavery of any kind, whether it's uh, labor and capital slavery or uh, basically prejudiced, uh, racial prejudice. So these are key elements that was revealed in mid 1800s that slowly seeping into the Western society. And unless and until we all agree and comply with it, we're going to cause to harm to ourselves and our citizens. Right. One of the criticisms of the Bible is that Jesus merely regulated slavery. He told the masters how to behave and he told the servants how to behave. He did not abolish slavery. He Correct. regulated it. He said, this is how you should conduct yourselves in the institution of slavery. Um, so that's one of the criticisms of the Bible from, from today's perspective when we look back and sit in judgment of past revelation. But remember, this socioeconomic system of the time, would the, the, it wouldn't work without it. That's the whole point. It wasn't a yeah, byproduct. It, 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 would have, it would have potentially caused more harm there would have been to potentially been more misery if you had forced forced that law prior to humanity being able to manage themselves. Actually, they, they've done these statistics that during uh, the time of Jesus, even after that, people would sell themselves into a slavery exactly. not to die from hunger. Exactly. Because they couldn't it, change the servitude. social system exactly. uh, at the time. That's so, exactly my point. Thank you. Right. So it had nothing to do with the Bible. What he was trying to do is remedy the harm that would cause with that interaction, which is obviously became obsolete during the uh, mid 1800s. Right. Let me give you one example. And this is when you, when you dive into it into what is actually said in the historical context, it's quite fascinating. There's a famous statement by Jesus called, turn the other cheek. The cause of that is it was legally allowed for a master to backhand his servant, to backhand his servant. So the statement, if he strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek, was because of the situation that it was illegally allowed to, to strike a servant but if you turn the other cheek, the servant would then have to forehand you, which was forbidden. And if if the master took advantage of you, so you just turn the other cheek. But if he then took advantage of you, you could then take him to court. And there are two other statements that have the exact same principle. One is if, if go the extra mile, if they if they command you to go a mile, go the extra mile. There's a very similar situation. I won't go into it. Right. The other one is if they demand your jacket, give them your shirt also. Another situation in each of these three cases, Jesus was saying, you must submit to this and you should do it willingly and with grace. But if they then proceed to take further advantage of you, you have legal recourse. That is built into those statements of Jesus, but nobody realizes it. But remember, it's very difficult to change a culture of people. 
and imagine the potency of Jesus's word that said that whoever is free of sin cast the first stone. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Daniel, you joined back in. You probably have something you wanted to add, or maybe you want to use like the hook and pull us off the stage here and land this plane. Yeah, I think we're going to land the plane. I mean, it's uh, we we went a half an hour over, but I the reason why I popped in is because, on you know, quite honestly, uh, I I see that um, secular responses aren't. Um, aren't the best responses for the argument, right? I mean, this it may sound like a little bit of a weird, um, uh, you know, a weird angle to come in on, but I think there, I think there's opportunities to make uh, both sides stronger arguments. And I think they're both um, uh, aligned in a similar place, right? I mean, I heard through Gilbert's uh, conversation today, and I thought the simplicity was very beautiful that, uh, science and religion are of the same the same bird or the same wing and or science is the wing of of god um i two I, wings not, of the same bird two wings of the same bird right exactly and i thought that was really beautiful because i do i do see that when um the ideas converge then you do have uh, a beauty there and um i don't think the division I don't think there is a division. I think there's a unity there. Um, and where there isn't, there's a failure with one or the other, and both of them are fallible. And even on on the by the admission of every religion, it's fallible. It knows it's fallible, at least on on the on the ground, right? I mean, so anyways. Um, guys, I want to thank you guys both for spending uh, so much time with us. And we'll be back again next week. And uh, thanks again, Gilbert. Thank you, Wade. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Take care.